Hey, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Kath Hardy and I work for the Biological Resource Division within the National Park Service. I serve as the team lead for our Connected Conservation Community of Practice and we are grateful to have a couple of presenters here uh, about to give us an inspiring presentation on light pollution. Um, we'll have Bob Meadows and Adam Dalton and I'll give a quick introduction to them in a minute. Uh, I have dropped a couple of links into the chat box there. You can learn more about our community of practice and join us in our, in our community if you'd like on um, two different sites. One is an internal site that serves um, the Department of Interior. It's a toolkit that we've put together that enables parks and programs to work beyond boundaries. Um, and then we also have an external uh, series of pages with a network for landscape conservation that our partners and, and others can access as well. Uh, we do host webinars once a month, so if you enjoy our webinar today, uh, we will record it and have it up on our on both sites um, shortly after the, the presentation today. But you can also learn about our future webinars um, that we have slated in the for the rest of 2019. We have, and if you ever have a topic that you think could benefit parks or practice that enables us to work beyond boundaries, we're all ears. So feel free to reach out to us and let us know. Today we have two presenters, as I mentioned. Um, Bob Meadows, who's a physical scientist with the National Park Service. He's with the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division. He's been with the Night Skies program since 2011. Prior to that, he worked for about 25 years in Sequoia Kings Canyon National Ranger for eight years and just has a, a really wonderful um, career with the National Park Service. Um, his current responsibilities include managing the 17 years of sky quality data from 125 park units, conducting measurements and assessing sky quality in the field, and working with parks to evaluate their lighting for efficiency and ecological impacts to the nighttime environment. In addition to Bob, we also have Adam Dalton, who is the International Dark Sky Places Program Manager. He's an Iowa native, and Adam's passion and awe of the night sky fully developed following his move to the Intermountain West in 2016. He's a recent graduate of the University of Utah's Master of City and Metropolitan Planning Program. He specialized in ecological planning and interdisciplinary sustainability. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our presenters today so that we can um, use as much time as we can hearing from them. Um, and Bob, I've unmuted both you and Adam now, and we can see your presentation. Okay, thank you, Cass. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. I see quite a variety, a lot of familiar names in there. Uh, somebody from Alaska, and uh, quite a, you know, quite a diversity. Um, Adam and I are today going to talk about kind of uh, the title says the evolution of dark sky conservation on National Park Service lands, and our relationship. Um, with the Night Skies Program um, and the International Dark Sky Association, which a lot of times you hear just referred to as IDA, in our work in um, preserving uh, night skies across the, the national park system. So this story goes back quite a ways, uh, long before I was with the, the Night Skies Program, Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division. And let's see if I can get this to advance here. On that, it's not, this particular slide's not advancing. Bob, it looks like in the bottom left corner, there's a couple of arrows. Can you try uh, those arrows? There we go. Bob, are you still there? Sorry, folks. Looks like we're having some technical difficulties. Bob, can you hear me? Adam, are you still there? I'm still here. I can hear you. OK. Bob, can you hear us?
We'll give him one more minute. And if not, Adam, we'll switch to your presentation first, and then we'll come back to Bob. That's totally fine. Yeah, I am totally understand. Okay. Bob, are you still there? Okay. Let's go ahead and do that. Adam, I'm going to make you the presenter. Sorry, folks. Uh, thanks for bearing with us. All right. Let's see here. Go to me. Let's see here. All right. Where's the... Here, let's... All right. I will get that um, pulled up really quickly then. Um, so here we go. Um, but yeah, I was not necessarily expecting to present at this point, but I will, um, I will now be fully ready. Um, but hopefully Bob can get back on the line as soon as possible. Um, that would be fantastic. Um, let's see here. Let's see here. Perfect. Okay, here we go. Um, Great, thanks Adam for being flexible. Oh, no problem. I said, yeah, it's absolutely no, no issue whatsoever. This, this presentation could realistically be um, viewed either way. So um, it's not a big issue. Um, all right, so, okay, I'm pulling the presentation up currently, and let's see here. I'll just take a second to load in. I should have my part ready pretty soon. Okay, um, slide, suit, view, presenter mode, present, perfect. Okay, so let's see here. Um, let's see, can we, let's see, can you see my screen now currently? It looks great. Per perfect. And then presenter mode should be. Yep. It looks great. Awesome. Fantastic. Good to hear. Okay. So, um, barring uh, these uh, technical issues, which uh, happen to start, I might like to introduce myself as Adam Daltman, the International Dark Sky Places uh, Program Coordinator at the International Dark Sky Association, otherwise known as IDA. This is a role I've stepped into fairly recently. Uh, many of you may be familiar with John Barentine. Uh, he was the Dark Side Places Program Coordinator for quite a while, but now has stepped into the role of IDA's Policy Coordinator. So I've been on this job for roughly about um, eight months. And I'll talk to you both about um, IDA, our Dark Sky Places designations, um, and also how that ties into the National Park Services essentially um, uh, work to mitigate um, and uh, fight against light pollution and to see the night sky as a valuable resource. So a little bit of background information for those of you who don't know about the International Dark Sky Association. Um, it was founded in 1988 um, by Tim Hunter and Dave Crawford. Essentially they were um, a professional and amateur astronomer um, near Tucson, Arizona, uh, which is why as you can see our headquarters are currently in Tucson, Arizona. They were, in, they were very um, concerned about the increase in sky glow, um, both impacting um, their amateur as well as professional um, astronomy careers. So they teamed up to find, to, to create an organization, which um, the mission statement continues to be, to preserve and protect the nighttime environment and our heritage of dark skies through environmentally responsible outdoor lighting. However, as time has progressed, the International Dark Sky Association has broadened our focus. Um, in 2001, we formally started the Dark Sky Places program, which many of you with, of which are familiar, and I'll describe in my presentation. But essentially, that's IDA's conservation outreach. So currently, um, the Dark Sky Places program has one and a half total employees. Um, myself and the program associate, Diana Del Solar. Essentially, what we do is there's five different types of designations worldwide, which I'll explain in a little bit. But essentially, our Dark Sky Places serve um, as models in the real world of places that protect and preserve the night sky through lighting design, lighting policy, through public education and outreach. Um, and our designation program is really meant to recognize such places that take um, incredible efforts to preserve and protect um, our dark skies in an increasingly light polluted world. Um, so our scope as an organization is international. Um, there's nine total employees um, for our organization as a whole. Um, and we've, uh, within the Dark Sky Places program, have designated places um, in nearly every continent. Um, uh, we have designations um, through Europe, Africa, South America. Um, well, however, the majority of our designations uh, are within the United States uh, as well as Western Europe. Um, something that we're, and that's something that we're hoping to um, expand to an even greater international scope with our increased program capacity as well as the awareness of the program. So, for more basic information, you can go to our website uh, here that you see at just darksky.org. Um, but with that um, being said, I will go now to speak to our different types of designations. So. As I mentioned before, um, there, uh, I work for the Dark Sky Places 
um, program, and there's five different types of designations within the program, which is dark sky parks, um, dark sky sanctuaries, urban night sky places, dark sky communities, and dark sky reserves. Um, the most prescient to the national park system are the dark sky parks. Um, that's the vast majority of designations that have, made, that have been made within the system so far. Um, however, there also is currently a sanctuary, um, and there's an interest to um, also apply to the um, night sky places as well as the reserves program. Um, currently, there's 110 places worldwide encompassing all these designations. And as I had mentioned before, um, the goal of Dark Sky Places um, is essentially um, multifold. It's a, to aim to inspire, to preserve, and protect the night sky through community outreach, education, lighting design, and policy in action. And as I mentioned before, Dark Sky Places really exemplify IDA's conservation goals um, uh, and fighting against light pollution and policies in the real world. So telling people that their lights need to be fully shielded or below a certain color temperature, um, having that kind of you know nebulous idea is, for some people, not necessarily helpful, but then to go out to a place um, and stargaze and to do an astronomy program or to see the lighting in action at night, you know, really drives home the point that um, you know, to fight light pollution, the, it's really a fairly simple process of you know, eliminating um, upward facing light eliminating light of inappropriate color temperatures and using light solely where it's needed. And I think that experience, um, both of seeing good lighting design and also, you know, having the chance to experience the night sky, which fewer and fewer people can experience now um, in the developed world, is something that's invaluable um, in this, that this program uh, facilitates. So going further, um, the first type of designation is dark sky parks. Um, I'm going to go through all the designation types within the next uh, few slides. Um, that being said, just due only to the time limit that I'm facing, um, I've kind of oversimplified a lot of the elements of the program. Um, but if you'd like more information, I've included links, some of this is going to be shared later, um, that you can go to to see our specific guidelines um, within each designation type. So our signature um, part of our Dark Sky Places program is our Dark Sky Parks designation. Um, currently, there's 45 parks uh, designated within the United States, as well as 22 within the National Parks Service. Um, these include national monuments, national parks, national scenic rivers, national historic sites, and other um, designations and other place types as well. Um, these are by far um, our largest by area as well as by number. Um, as you can see in the background, um, that's one of our dark sky parks. You can see the Milky Way clearly rising above the racetrack Playa in Death Valley in this beautiful photo taken by Cindy and Dan Dorisco. Um, so the first question that comes to mind for a lot of people is, you know, what kind of place um, does my um, park or my um, land apply to? And um, I'm trying to help with this presentation kind of um, explain the differences between designation types. So as I mentioned, the goal of all designation types is very similar, um, but the specifics of such are a bit different. So first off, um, there's a sky quality requirement, requirement for parks um, within our most recent set of guidelines. Um, some of you may be familiar with our old set of guidelines in which we specified sky quality tiers, but under the 2018 guidelines, um, that went away. And there, there's, there essentially is just a singular cutoff at 21.2 magnitudes and arc second squared. Um, so essentially, you're either on the left side of that, which is that you are not dark enough to qualify, or you're on the right side of that, um, and you're dark enough to qualify. And then for those of you who are not necessarily familiar, um, magnitudes per arc second is a measure of surface brightness. So essentially, this is measured using a fairly simple device called a sky quality meter, which is pointed directly overhead. Um, so essentially, that gives us a basic baseline of how um, the surface brightness of the sky above you is um, in terms of uh, the starlight and whatnot. So essentially, the, that scale goes anywhere from around 16 to 22. Um, and if you're more familiar with the Bordel scale, um, the sky quality of a, of a Bordel um, class three or four sky is equivalent to the cutoff um, of our sky quality requirement for dark sky parks. Um, we also measure um, within our applications uh, sky quality in other ways as well. Um, we also like to see panoramic um, uh, photography. Um, that way we were able to ascertain what light domes are on the distance. So we're able to use quantitative as well as qualitative measures to look at the park's uh, sky quality. So that's something that's required for all dark sky parks as well as continued measuring of sky quality over time to see how it changes um, owing to either improvements in the park's lighting or to increasing uh, urbanization near the park just to understand what the situation of the night sky in the park is um, uh, as designation um, uh, has occurred in um, as the years go by. So 
that's one element of the Dark Sky Park Places program. Additionally, um, uh, as with all other designation types, a lighting management plan must be adopted by the park's um, managing authority. So essentially, the lighting management plan addresses a lot of aspects of outdoor lighting. Um, so it addresses um, issues such as lighting color temperature, um, essentially how light appears. Um, we essentially, within our guidelines, uh, do not allow lighting um, within this case above 2700 Kelvin. Um, which means that only lighting on the more orange, um, amber, warmer end of the spectrum is going to uh, meet the criteria for our guidelines for the dark sky parks. Additionally, lights within dark sky parks are to be fully shielded. Um, and additionally, something that we like our applicants to think about is to also include um, as a requirement a clause which is exploring warranting of lighting because in many instances within the modern world, we just by default light the night sky um, in night environment. I know that parks are a little bit different um, just because they're more ecologically sensitive areas, but in many instances we find lighting, um, even within parks, that um, is redundant or not necessary. So then we also need um, evidence of uh, thought and criteria for when future lighting instances would be warranted. And then aside from that, also just considering um, timers or curfews for applicable lighting as well. Um, and there's also additional other elements which you can see in the guidelines linked above. So. Essentially, um, we require a lighting management plan or lighting ordinance, um, depending on what type of designation you're applying for, um, for all types of designations because without that kind of um, concrete policy um, and, force, and enforceability behind uh, actions taking place, uh, we believe that that's the best way to uh, enforce lasting and uh, measurable change uh, to positively impact the night sky environment and to fight light pollution. And then another element of the dark sky park designation um, which is similar to other designations as well, is the restorative project and outreach. So dark sky parks, um, per our guidelines, are required um, at least four times a year uh, to host outreach events. Many parks um, <clears throat> do outreach events much more often, but these outreach events are supposed to focus on light pollution, its effects, um, and also um, talk about night skies. Um, so essentially, this is something that we like to see because in instances of dark sky parks, one of their main functions is to serve as places that the public can become exposed both to the night sky as well as the issue of light pollution. Uh, additionally, parks are required to complete a restorative project, which is interpretable. So for example, um, we've had parks under our program who have uh, done lighting retrofits and then created an exhibit um, that, directors are, that um, visitors are allowed to um, uh, essentially look at after it has been completed to understand visually um, how lighting impacts you know, the night environment in terms of glare, in terms of sky glow and whatnot. Um, additionally, dark sky parks can work with municipalities or other organizations outside of the park to help improve conditions for the park. That's another way to complete the restorative project element. So, for example, we've had parks who've worked with nearby communities um, or even within, um, you know, their counties to uh, enact lighting ordinances which have uh, positively impacted the park's environment. So that's a very brief kind of overview of the dark sky parks program. Um, going forward um, to one of our um, more niche designations, the Dark Sky Sanctuary designation. There's currently only one Dark Sky Sanctuary within the National Park System, which is Rainbow Bridge. Um, there's three in the U.S., though. So essentially what makes Dark Sky Sanctuaries different from a Dark Sky Park uh, is twofold. So first off, Dark Sky Sanctuaries um, generally have sky quality, which is exceptionally dark. So the sky quality has to, at minimum, be 21 and a half magnitudes in our second squared which if you're familiar with the Bortle scale is around a Bortle 2 uh, or Bortle 1. So some of the darkest night skies in the world. Additionally, aside from being just dark, dark sky sanctuaries are also meant to highlight places that have limited access or staffing capacity. So that's why Rainbow Bridge is a sanctuary because it has extremely limited access as well as a small staff. Other places within the, the, night, uh, the NPS system which could theoretically apply to sanctuary um, status would be like Gila Cliff dwellings or somewhere else that just has, you know, a very bare bones staff that's very remote and um, not easily accessible by the public. Um, so the, the access and staffing combined with the sky quality are what makes the sanctuary designation different than the park designation. Because there are some parks that have sky quality which is comparable to sanctuaries. For example, Glacier is exceptionally dark. Um, sections of Death Valley are exceptionally dark. But because they're le because they're more um, they're they're more highly staffed, they have the ability to hold regular outreach, and they also have better accessibility in terms of paved roads and whatnot. Um, there are parks as opposed to sanctuaries. So this is kind of a case by case basis, which allows um, smaller, um, more remote places with exceptional sky quality to still come within our program. Um, going on, we have urban night sky places. 
There's currently none in the national park system and none in the United States, and that's not because this is an impossible designation to achieve, but it's because it's a brand new designation. So within uh, 2018, um, IDA released a new set of guidelines for all of our programs, and we actually created a new Urban Night Sky Place program um, because we realized there was a huge hole within our designations because there's no way to essentially recognize places that were impacted by light pollution, but still took all of the best efforts in terms of community outreach, in terms of lighting, um, to fight light pollution and raise awareness of the issue within their own context. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, I, I didn't mention this before, but most um, uh, park and sanctuary and uh, we're imagining urban night sky place applications take anywhere between a year to three years um, to complete in their entirety um, from start to finish, which is since the guidelines have only been out for roughly about seven months is why we have not um, had any finished applications. However, to note, um, there's actually going to be an urban night sky place reviewed in our next um, review session. So we actually may have our very first urban night sky place in the next month or so. But essentially, um, aside from highlighting places which take best actions in terms of um, conservation as well as um, public awareness uh, in urban areas. Um, the other goals of the Urban Outside Places um, uh, are essentially to show people what good lighting looks like in a public sphere. Um, so there's no minimum sky quality. Um, you could be Central Park, um, you could be in the most light polluted area in the world, but if you're a publicly owned space, um, which essentially takes great effort to um, promote uh, good lighting and light pollution outreach, um, you can be an urban night sky place. The only criteria um, uh, entirely surrounded or within the 50 kilometer radius of a metro area of at least 50,000 people. Um, that sounds pretty nebulous, but just to explain that a little bit more, um, just imagine the closest city to you. If you basically took the urban boundaries of the city, um, and then made a 50 kilometer um, line around that in the, the whatever regular shape the city's boundaries are, anything within that area would qualify as an urban night sky place. Um, national parks, which are impacted um, uh, by uh, light pollution are within 50 kilometers of a metro area are able to apply to this program, but just something about these guidelines which is unique is that um, because this was originally envisioned for smaller parks, Lighting has to be 100% compliant with the adopted lighting management plan um, upon time of application. So for larger national parks or national park units, um, monuments, what be it near um, uh, urban areas which are impacted by light pollution, um, the only necessarily um, thing that would make this designation more difficult is that 100% lighting uh, compliance has to be achieved. Um, with the lighting management plan to achieve full designation under this program, whereas within parks, um, sanctuaries, reserves, all the other types, uh, two-thirds of lighting must be compliant. Um, going further, dark sky communities um, is, probably comes as no surprise to anyone. There's none within the national park system because the national park system doesn't deal with communities necessarily. Um, however, there's 16 within the United States. Um, the reason I'm speaking about this is because if you look at the image below, um, that's the Salt Lake Valley, you can see that the light from the Salt Lake metro area, um, the light dome spills tens, um, if not hundreds of miles um, into the surrounding night sky. Um, light pollution, much like um, uh, ground water pollution uh, or air pollution, um, really is a regional issue. Um, and if people within the national park system, um, via park managers or park employees, are able to coordinate with nearby gateway communities um, or other communities in the region to help improve sky conditions, um, that really can help focus uh, uh, essentially night skies uh, preservation uh, as a as a regional effort, which helps to um, not only improve the sky quality, but to help make it a more sustainable um, and essentially a multifaceted approach to really tackling this issue. So for communities, um, additionally, they must adopt a lighting ordinance. Um, the proposed area must be a legally organized community. So for example, um, uh, we've actually dealt with unincorporated communities before, and that actually they are allowed to apply underneath the program, but they actually have to get an ordinance passed by the relevant authority. So we're actually, I'm currently working on a case such as that um, in which the county actually has to adopt the ordinances which apply to the um, community. So there's, there's ways to go around this, but generally they're legally organized community. And there's also similar to urban night sky parks, um, no minimum sky quality because in a similar vein to urban night sky park uh, places, um, dark sky communities are meant to highlight communities which take um, 
to help reduce lighting pollution both through their own um, adapted ordinances, through their own lighting retrofits, as well as their public education components. So, and then finally, going to our last designation type, um, dark sky reserves. There's one in the United States, which is the Central Idaho Dark Sky Reserve, which you may have heard of. However, they're not in the National Park System. Um, very similar to dark sky parks, um, dark sky reserves have a sky quality um, requirement that's minimum 21.2 magnitudes in arc second squared. Um, much like parks, very similarly, restorative projects and outreach must be conducted uh, to a generally similar level to park designation, um, and a lighting management plan must be adopted. But the difference between reserves and parks is that reserves generally include multiple designation types. So if there's a dark sky community abutting a dark sky park, which is abutting an area um, of public land which hasn't adopted a you know, lighting ordinance, but then um, wants to adopt a lighting ordinance to conform with the nearby park, um, that whole um, area could come under um, designation as a dark sky reserve. So thinking of dark sky reserves as, a com as basically a combination designation of other designations is the most, um, I think, easy way to think about it. Um, dark sky reserves are much more common in Europe, actually, because a lot of Europe's national parks actually include communities that's inside of them. Um, so essentially, this is a very um, common designation kind of within the more European park system. But it's a model that we're hoping to use in the United States to protect large areas um, uh, of different land uses um, and uh, reduce light pollution and perpetuity in some of these ecologically sensitive areas. So going further, I'm just tying into the National Park Service. Um, IDA and our Dark Sky Places program collaborates with a lot of different elements and um, uh, of the National Park System as well as others. Um, so we work very closely with the National Park Service, uh, National Sounds and Nice Guys Division. Clearly, Bob and I are both presenting this together, um, but uh, we work very closely with the um, division um, as they take nice guy photometry data. They also advise some of our applicants um, on how to best approach um, their designations and their applications. So we work very closely with, the na with that division. Additionally, um, I work very closely with the, na the National Park Service regional coordinators. Um, for example, I work with Randy Stanley of the Inner Mountain Division. Um, he helps, um, helps uh, advise applicants within the Aaron Mountain region um, regarding their dark sky place applications, and we both communicate back and forth regarding ways um, which uh, can help the applicants and connect them to further resources. Um, additionally, the Colorado Plateau Dark Sky Cooperative and Consortium for Dark Sky Studies um, at the University of Utah have proven invaluable um, partners. Um, the cooperative model essentially links a large geographic area, this being the Colorado Plateau, and helps to connect applicants together who have already achieved our sky designation or are hoping to achieve our sky designation um, and to focus on the issue at a regional uh, and comprehensive level. Um, and we're actually hoping to establish additional cooperatives in other areas of the United States as well uh, following the Colorado Plateau model. Um, and then additionally, the Consortium for Dark Sky Studies at the University of Utah has tons of students who are willing to um, undertake dark sky research. In fact, they recently um, established the first um, academic dark sky program, which is their dark sky minor. Um, and aside from that, we have many other collaborations. So something to note is that we work very closely with the National Park Service, um, and uh, there's a lot of overlap between that. So um, additionally, if you have any questions or want more info, um, my position as a dark sky places program coordinator is essentially to answer all questions that anyone applying to the program has regarding their application, um, regarding specific rules, um, regarding um, how to best um, inventory regarding really anything about the application. So, and then my goal is essentially to act as a go-between for the final review committee who ultimately reviews applications and between the applicants. So, I'm essentially a mediating force which tries to help smoothen the process out as much as possible and then give applicants the best chance of success at being approved as a dark sky place when it's ultimately reviewed. So, if you have questions or want more info, um, you have my phone, email, Skype, uh, as well as my snail mail address. So you can contact me by any of the following methods, and I would be more than happy to help you out. Um, so then additionally, um, uh, the last slide is I would like to thank you. Um, there's Bob on the left and me on the right, but um, I think we can uh, hold off on that uh, until uh, Bob is, uh, his presentation uh, section is over. So I'd like to thank you all for um, listening to my brief overview of the Dark Sky Places program, and I look forward to your questions afterwards. So thank you. Thanks so much, Adam. And we do have Bob back on the line. Bob, can you hear us? I can. I hope everybody can hear me now. Uh, okay, great. So, um, Bob, why don't you go ahead and run through your presentation, and then 
folks who are, are listening in, and I can see some questions coming in, but um, throughout the presentation, feel free to plug questions into that question box, and we'll address them after Bob's presentation. Adam, thanks again for your flexibility. Um, Bob, no take problem. it away. Okay, thanks. Sorry for the little bit of technical difficulty. Not uncommon. Um, I thought I was being heard by everybody, and but we'll move forward here. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about the dark sky park kind of idea and, and program from the National Park Service perspective and kind of give a little history. Uh, it, oh, it evolved from the early days of the MPS Night Skies program and, and other things into what Adam um, talked about today. So um, let's see, are we, is everybody still hearing me? I still can't advance the slides, though, for some reason. Hmm. I can hear you okay, Bob. Um, it should be, I think, in that bottom left corner, I had seen a little arrow to advance your slide. Um, I'm in slideshow presentation here. Do I need to go? just go back? I'm, I'm not seeing that one. Let's see. How about this? Um, Adam, if you're okay with it, maybe we can put your presentation back on and you can move through the slides for Bob. Would that be okay? That is 100% fine with me. Um, as long as Great. you give me the screen, um, I'll be able to do that. Okay, That'll here we go. Fine. We'll try this one time again. Yeah, and I'll just, just, I'll just cue Adam who's going through. It's just bizarre That's that Bob perfect. isn't working, but either way, this should work out. So. Um, I'll just enlarge. There we go. Okay, and I'll start out with kind of a, the origins as, as, as I've learned about it and talking to some other people. Um, going back to uh, 2001, um, you know, the first dark sky community at Flagstaff was established. Chris Luganbuehl, who was an astronomer at the U.S. Naval Observatory. Bob, did we lose you again? Adam, are you still there? Uh, yes, I'm still here. Okay. Sounds like folks, we have, um, Bob might have an issue with his phone line. Um, let's go ahead and move to questions and answers. And if he comes back on, he can continue the presentation. Um, I know a few of you had plugged in questions into the uh, the question box there. Thank you for doing that. Um, and if you haven't seen where that is, it should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, Adam, you can address these as, as best as you can. Um, and then if we Perfect. need to um, tap Bob after, we can always send in follow-up uh, questions and, and send them out to all the participants. Uh, the first question is, I think that Dry Tortugas National Park will be good for a sanctuary designation designation as remote as it gets within the USA. So maybe more of a comment than a question, but if you have any mm -hmm. comments on that. I think that, I mean, based on what I know from the sky quality. I think now, I, oh. can you hear me now? Oh, Bob, you're back. Yep. I'm back. You know what I think? I think we have a uh, headset that has failed. I think I'm back okay. on now. Okay. Okay. Let's, um, we had just asked one question from the question box, so I'm just going to go ahead and let Adam uh, answer that so we stay on task there, and then we can come back to your presentation. Adam, okay. did you have a Sorry comment on that. the dry tortugas one? That's okay. Oh, yeah, I would say the dry tortugas. I mean, based on what I know from the uh, the sky quality map, um, which I'm relatively familiar with, as well as um, my knowledge of dry tortugas location off the coast of, um, the Florida, of Florida, I think that it would probably most likely qualify as a sanctuary, both owing to its remoteness um, and limited capacity as well as its exceptionally dark sky. So I think that um, of all places, um, dry tortugas would be very appropriate for a sanctuary designation. Great. Okay, back to you, Bob. Okay, sorry about that again. It looks like I think my uh, headset has died in the middle of starting this again, so I'm just on the old-fashioned phone handsets here. So my slide's still up here. It looks like this is you're Adam, you're still in control here? Correct. Okay, and um, I don't know how much 
anybody heard on this, but just getting back to the origins, this um, statement here is from a letter that Chris Luganbuehl from the U.S. Naval Observatory and Flagstaff, uh, as part of the application package for natural bridges back in 2006 when this was done, um, really recognized the, the Chief Ranger Ralph Jones at Natural Bridges um, as promoting the idea of a dark sky park um, kind of expanding upon the original dark sky place of Flagstaff as a community and knowing the unique natural conditions, the great night sky that Natural Bridges had. So um, this led to you know the development uh, of some criteria. Um, you know, moving forward, this was kind of the 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 origins of the what today is the Dark Sky Places program that Adam manages. If you want to go ahead one slide here? Perfect. So, born out of that original conversation with Natural Bridges was the idea. Okay, we need to come up with some kind of objectives if this Dark Sky Park uh, idea is going to um, continue on. So. Some objectives were identified, um, very much in line um, with what the National Park Service uh, goals and, and you know enabling legislations identified, and you know briefly to identify and honor protected public lands with exceptional commitment to and success in implementing the ideals of dark sky preservation and our restoration to preserve and restore outstanding night skies, promote protection of nocturnal habitat, public enjoyment of the night sky and its heritage in areas ideal for professional and amateur astronomy, to encourage park administrators to identify dark skies as a valuable resource in need of protect, proactive protection, provide international recognition for such parks, and to encourage parks and similar public entities to become environmental leaders on dark sky issues. So forth. Go ahead, one. So this original development committee consisted of four individuals. Um, Chris Luganbuehl, who was an IDA board member at the time um, as part of the U.S. Naval Observatory, Ralph Jones from uh, Natural Bridges National Monument, Angie Richman, um, who was at the time an astronomy education consultant, but she had also been um, working with the Night Skies program in its infancy at that point. She's now um, a chief of interpretation in the Southeast Utah group. And then there needed to be a review panel. Um, you know, if there was an application or future applications beyond Natural Bridges, uh, kind of an independent panel to review the application to see if the park, you know, has met those objectives um, and basically say yes to, to this designation. And that consisted of three of those four people on the development committee originally. Ultimately, this, this role as Natural Bridges was designated, um, and, and it was realized that it really needs to find a home permanently within IDA itself, and that progressed and ultimately became um, the Dark Sky Places uh, position that Adam fills these days. So, kind of, it was it kind of was created independently of IDA, but with their participation initially. We can go ahead here, Adam. So then I'll back up a little bit to the origins of the MPS Night Skies program. Um, and this two individuals here is Dan Dorisco on the left and Chad Moore on the right. Um, going back quite a ways, and I worked with Dan Dorisco for many years at Sequoia Kings Canyon and um, became aware of his passion for um, the night skies. As, and Dan, uh, Chad had the same thing going back. They were both amateur astronomers in their youth and um, had these shared ideals. Well, by 1999, um, Judy Rocchio in the Pacific West region um, knew both of them and, and introduced them, um, thinking these people have the same ideas about night sky preservation. So Dan and Chad got together, had a goal of, of developing instrumentation and methified, methods to quantify night sky quality. And initially, they were looking at documenting the remaining night sky areas that are you know, were truly close to natural conditions most of them being in the kind of the Great Basin, uh, Four Corners, Intermountain region, um, before those conditions were lost, perhaps. So that they went about that, developed a, a very unique 
camera system, which is still a state of the art in the in the world today. And by 2001, we're collecting data at, at a number of these parks. By 2003, they had resigned their permanent positions, Chad at Pinnacles National Monument at the time, and Dan at Sequoia Kings Canyon to begin this program full time, um, utilizing grants and other funding sources. And Bryce Canyon National Park agreed to actually host them. That was the kind of the home of the Night Skies program. Uh, all there kind of in the, the remaining um, core of, of what was considered still very good night, night skies. Uh, advance one. OK, and then we had some guidance. Um, MPS management policies 4.10 under lightscape management. The service will preserve to the greatest extent possible the natural lightscapes at parks, which are natural resources and values that exist in the absence of human-caused light. To prevent the loss of dark conditions and of natural night skies, the service will minimize light that emanates from parks and facilities. And we also to seek the cooperation of park visitors, neighbors, and local government agencies to prevent or minimize the intrusion of artificial light into the night scene of the ecosystems of parks. And you can see a lot of this in that initial objectives of what became the IDA uh, guidelines. And advance one, please. So what is the MPS doing to address this policy? Well, we have an initial inventory of sky quality conditions at parks going back to those that first year in 2001. Um, subsequent to that, we've been creating um, over a number of years and really um, even more so focused these, these days on creating continental models of all sky brightness. Um, very important given that we, we have a limited number of these camera systems, about five or six of them, and just do not have the capacity to to get out in those 12 new moon windows a year and hope for clear skies um, with over 420 MPS units. Um, we've been developing new methods and tools for measuring glare and significant impacts in the West uh, has a major impact. So trying to come up with with tools that are easily transferable to the park level, um, something a little different than our all sky camera systems. Our policy planning and compliance branch here in our division um, is really you know, the important part of providing reviews, plans, compliance documents related to the night sky resources, whether it's EAs or EISs, resource stewardship documents, any kind of proposed development. This branch really has the opportunity at that point to use the science and and our data and provide inputs to parks on how to address you know, any impending um, issue for the park. And then we're also developing guidance on lighting retrofits and new installations. And this is becoming very important today as more and more parks are switching out their lighting, uh, as well as uh, communities and, and bigger cities and other things. So trying to stay ahead of that and providing the best available um, technology and, and solutions um, to parks is, is one of our main goals right now. Go ahead and advance. This is not new by any means. And I, I pulled out a couple of old documents here going back to 1997 at Yosemite. They had an exterior lighting guideline. And then the other big uh, Y Park, as we call it, Yellowstone National Park, back in 2005 um, under the, you know, really Lynn Chan there, a landscape architect, was was and still is the, the driving force behind lighting guidelines for Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone has over 5,000 outside lights, as, as does Grand Canyon, and Yosemite pretty close to that type of number. So very important that these, you know, the thought about what outdoor lighting is, is doing to the nighttime environment, that was, that was not a foreign um, topic, even going back before the Night Skies program even started. Uh, please advance. So touching on you know the idea of, OK, the MPS is getting out there, and we're out there measuring sky quality, doing baseline assessments. This is a map, almost up to date, um, of every place where we have taken our camera system and, and measured the sky quality conditions at night. A pretty good um, distribution here, as you can see in the kind of the uh, Great Basin Four Corners area. Uh, there's quite a concentration. Well, there's obviously a lot of parks. There's a lot of really 
high quality sky conditions um, conducive to being out at night and that's also based on the program originating at Bryce Canyon National Park um, the reason we have such a, a concentration there we've also kind of branched out into the eastern US um, as well as Alaska and Hawaii and places like that and if I were to take this map and start you know if we populated where the uh, current dark sky parks are you'd still get a fairly high concentration you know in Utah Arizona New Mexico Colorado but there's a few scattered out in the eastern US uh, Big Cypress Preserve in Florida was the first one in the entire eastern US and now we have uh, Obed Wild and Scenic River and a, and a number of others that are, I think, in the queue and looking to pursue this um, dark sky park designation. And, and when we get park, we get a number of parks that send us technical assistance requests saying they're interested in pursuing this dark sky park designation. And one of the first things we do if we are able to respond and provide support in the way of data or other information is we kind of want to emphasize from the park service perspective that we we really don't want the park just to look at the designation as a you know a one and done type of thing. We really think of parks and and there I think most of them embrace this as the night sky resource is is a bigger issue. And if they're doing all the appropriate things to preserve the night sky, to interpret the night sky, um, to do outreach with the communities, um, to educate the public, um, all these kind of things that if and, and you know, do a lighting inventory, address their own internal lighting. Once they do all those things, this, these designations really become just a, a natural byproduct, and it's a recognition of their efforts, um, of a bigger, bigger effort that they're doing in park. And it, it's not an easy thing. And I know Adam, you know, touched on a lot of that. It's, it's not as simple as just having a measurement saying, yes, we're given our geography, we're, we're a dark sky park, and. Um, give us a certificate so there's a lot that goes into it and, and we really it, it's a really good partnership um, having this independent organization um, reward parks for their for their resource protection efforts with this go ahead and uh, move this one forward please so this is um, going to show kind of what we call a range of sky quality that we've measured um, and these images are kind of the product from our CCD camera system. Uh, many of you might have seen these over the years and some of them for your own parks and things like that. These are, this is an equal area representation of the entire night sky. Um, and then we've applied, our camera takes a, uh, a monochromatic you know, images, black and white, but we've applied a false color ramp and a logarithmic scale to kind of really um, easily display the relative brightness and darkness of sky quality conditions across a range of areas. And we have, like I said, over 125 parks where we've collected data, over 500 nights of data, and, and a number of parks at numerous locations if they're larger parks. As you can see here, this is this is quite a range. And the upper left here is kind of the northern, more remote reaches of Glen Canyon National Recreation Area along the Hole in the Rock Road, almost a complete natural sky. Um, devoid of any anthropogenic light, just a, a natural light, you know, lightscape at night, a fabulous place. And as we move down through still excellent places, we have Great Basin National Park in, in Nevada, Acadia National Park in, in the Northeast, you know, well known for their night sky outreach efforts and star festivals and, and programming. And they have some local light issues. Um, I believe Acadia is, you know, still pursuing um, dark sky park certification. That's I'm not directly, we're not directly involved in that, but even given some of the light sources they have from Bar Harbor and places like that, um, they are actively, you know, working towards that. Then you start to move in to these little brighter areas. We have Pinnacles National Park, um, impacts from, you know, even as far away as the Bay Area here. And then on the, the upper right, we start to progress into Channel Islands National Park, which is unique because there really is almost no, um, light facilities anywhere on any of the islands of, of uh, Channel Islands. And you would think, oh, this is an, an incredibly dark sky, a natural night sky. But you go out there and, and you realize how 
lights from adjoining communities or distant cities, um, sometimes up to 400 miles away in the real arid um, Intermountain West, can have an impact on parks. So Channel Islands here, they're looking directly across at Ventura, Oxnard, all the way down to the greater Los Angeles Basin. And then you get into uh, Golden Gate National Recreation Area, obviously, even on the fringes of the city, uh, quite an impact there. City of Las Vegas from um, maybe 20 miles away. Um, this is not too far different than what you'd see in, in parts of Lake Mead National Recreation Area. And then uh, at the absolute extreme, this is Griffith Park um, in Mount Hall at Mount Hollywood, which is right on the edge of Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. And that's basically the city of Los Angeles lighting things up. So a lot of parks are interested in pursuing dark sky park status, but just given the geography of many of them, it's probably not something that that's you know really possible right now. It doesn't mean they shouldn't be doing appropriate things which are you know under the the requirements of a dark sky park um, to improve their local conditions. Um, but it is going to, to limit you know some of the the ability of the parks on that. And you can move this ahead, Adam. So. And I don't think Adam talked on each individual. Here's currently where we are with um, the dark sky parks within the national park system. And this is, I created this chrono chronological order of parks. And you can see from the beginning, Natural Bridges 2007. It was five years later before Big Ben National Park um, became the second MPS unit. And then Death Valley shortly after that, was along with Chaco Culture. And then slowly started to get you know more more parks interested. Grand Canyon Parachant was the first uh, interagency um, designation, both National Park Service and BLM um, managing that unit. Um, and then um, by 2015, 16, and 17, a lot of interest. And um, as we progress through here, right now, we, we get these technical assistance requests. And I, I think we're getting at least five or six every year from new parks all across the system that are interested in this um, as part of a bigger effort to preserve the night sky resource um, on that. So I think there's two on here, um, Grand Canyon National Park and Glacier National Park that are in provisional status right now. Um, a few more steps and a few more goals to reach before they're, they're out of provisional status in that. And then um, out of all these parks, Rainbow Bridge is the one that's um, a sanctuary. The rest of them are designated parks. and um, we're working on some others. Um, I don't want to get ahead of too much of what IDA is doing on that. Uh, many of you on the part on the on this webinar may be part of that effort. So, uh, Adam, go ahead, please. And this is kind of where it all began with natural bridges. And in this image, I was here in 2011. Um, actually, um, Dan was back there in 2003 the first time. But in this image, you, this is the full developed area of natural bridges in the foreground there. As you can see, there is no outdoor light emanating at night there. They, are, they were very cognizant. They did an initial inventory back in 2005 or so, and they had 52 outdoor lights. Uh, not uncommon at, at many MPS units. But in an area like this, even one light causes a, a significant impact. So they did their inventory of 52 lights. They found that five of them were not needed, and they could remove those. The others, um, with the help of Chad Moore coming in and, and um, with some grant money, using at that time you know, the best technology available for uh, luminaires, full cutoff fixtures, uh, low color temp lamps. And the park staff embraced this also. There's all the residences are in this image. And, even at night, they are cognizant to have their blinds closed or really limit the indoor lights, because even light from an in, inside of a building um, really goes across the landscape. So this is a this was like the classic example of it can be done and um, really kind of preserving the, those natural conditions at natural bridges. Go ahead, one. And then I moved to just I will finish off here with the second park, Big Bend National Park. And um, whereas Chad was very instrumental in helping Natural Bridges, Dan Dariska, Big Bend National Park. And again, Big Bend is 
every bit one of the, the darkest, most natural night skies within the National Park System anywhere in the lower 48, given its very isolated location from any developed area. Probably the closest city of any size is going to be down in Mexico, which, which can be a concern. But Big Ben um, was able to uh, obtain a grant for outdoor lighting, and uh, an outdoor lighting company called Musco Lighting out of Iowa, um, Iowa, uh, Adams' hometown, who really specialized in stadium lighting and things like that. But the uh, the owner of the company was very much um, a fan of the National Park Service, and they, um, along with that grant, went into the park and did a very customized lighting retrofit of the entire developed zone in the Chisos Basin, uh, doing lighting levels and, and doing things that had never even been thought of before. Um, so you take this this landscape, this, this image at night, almost totally natural. Adam, you can go to the next slide. And they're fading. And this is the Chisos Basin Lodge after the retrofit. And I have a slide following up. But these are very low light levels. Those bollards along the sidewalk there are one watt amber LEDs. That's as low as you can imagine. And then all of the lighting on the, the lodge facilities, downward lighting over the doors only, um, very warm color temps, very minimalized. Uh, one more slide, and this will be the, kind of the key key image of, of what the park can do. Bringing it in slowly, fading in. And this is an image that Dan took from the summit of Emory Peak in uh, Big Ben, and, and many of you have seen this before, but in the top is prior to the, the development and prior to the park's interest in you know preserving their night skies and pursuing dark sky park uh, status. You can see, and it's a relatively small development, a lodge, a visitor center, some housing, some other maintenance facilities, that, that light, most of it was just being wasted and scattered into the atmosphere and lighting up the entire basin, mountain walls, and everything else. After the lighting retrofit that was done in um, around 2009-2010, um, a dramatic improvement in the in the nighttime environment there. All the lights really just staying there on the ground on task and the entire surrounding area much more of a natural environment, what it should be, what the park services are meant you know, to reserve in that. So this dark sky places program which you know primarily the National Park Service is utilizing utilizing the dark sky parks designation, um, although there may be some others, has really been beneficial to the NPS and to, you know, to the international community as, as examples of, of what we could do. Um, and the collaboration with IDA that we, you know, continues to this day has really been helpful in developing guidance um, to parks as well as, you know, when the parks need to go to the communities, this, this information. So this is about where I would have transitioned to Adam if, uh, my audio would work uh, okay, but uh, whatever time left, happy to answer questions. Any more questions? Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Bob. And thanks again, Adam. At this point, we'll go ahead and um, turn over to the questions that we have in the box. Once again, if you do have questions, go ahead and plug them into um, that box. It should be on your right-hand side there. Um, our first question is, uh, let's see. Urban night sky parks have perfect designations for the NPS units, close to big light polluted cities like Las Vegas, Miami, LA. These designations motivate the surrounding communities, cities, and counties to play a role. Uh, this is obviously a little bit more of a comment. Um, we have seen these in Big Cypress. Two counties stated started redoing their lighting ordinances because of the NPS designation. So please, we want NPS to pursue urban night sky park designations. Um, any comments or thoughts on that from our two presenters? I'll quickly, you know, I, I think I touched on that in the range of sky quality conditions across the Parks Service. Um, we absolutely would not discourage any park from pursuing some kind of recognition for their efforts in, you know, preserving or enhancing, you know, the, the visitor's ability to experience a night sky, to improving conditions for wildlife. Um, and, and I know it's IDA's role to come up with the appropriate designation based on the relative sky quality. So, Adam, anything you want to add to that? I just think that it, it, I would agree with you in saying that it's invaluable. And I think that, you know, just as time has gone on, I mean, the Park Service has recognized, you know, 
historically, you know, ground pollution, air pollution, you know, other kinds of pollution as, you know, instrumental in the environmental um, quiver, you know, per se. And I think that with an increasing awareness of light pollution, you know, being a core conservation um, element, I think that, you know, that was our goal in instituting this Urbanized Sky Places program is because um, a place doesn't have to be naturally dark to do the right thing. And I think that just recognizing places that do the right thing and take that conservation and educate the public um, definitely should be recognized and I think fits very well within the National Parks uh, ethos of conservation overall. Great. Another question that's coming to the queue, who's the first person that the parks should contact within the NPS when they decide to begin their application process? You know, there's a couple of answers for that, um, depending on their region. Here in the Intermountain region, I mean, our I work for Washington office, but I'm in the Intermountain region here in Colorado. Um, our Intermountain regional office has a Natural Sounds and Night Skies coordinator, Randy Stanley. So if your region has that, and I mentioned uh, Judy Rocchio, she's recently retired in the Pacific West region. Sometimes I would initially go to your regional rep. Um, right now, a lot of those roles aren't filled. You could absolutely come to the to the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division. Um, I we're also going to direct you to contact Adam. If you're Questions that have come to the air, considerations incorporated in all facility or utility uh, NEPA, and what do you think can be done to create lighting or dark sky requirements in concessions contracts? Uh, I could touch upon you know the NEPA side of things, and that again is most of those types of, of documents get our review from our policy planning and compliance branch from um, environmental protection specialists, um, planners, things like that. So we have a say in that at the, at the touching on the, you know, the concession contracts and lighting. I know there's some differences in that. I was at um, Shenandoah National Park a number of years ago doing some sky quality assessments and talking to the resource um, staff there and even the superintendent actually. They, they had an opportunity in their arrangement that they can almost, I wouldn't say dictate, but really control um, the contracts and what's required in the way of lighting, maybe when the contract's up for renewal, um, put in some language, or, or even use funds that they they gain from, from those concession contracts to address the lighting. It's, it's unique for each park. Uh, Death Valley has a private end holding for all of their um, concessions, so the Park Service really has no say in what they do. It, but most of the time, concessions are very much um, aligned with the same ideals on, on preservation, night skies being one of them, that they're, you know, they're willing to um, address those issues and learn and, and make the right decisions. Um, a lot of them have sustainability um, people on staff who, who really do address this. So I, it's a slow process, and we're not always um, ahead of the game, and, and sometimes, you know, poor installations are done, um, but it's it's definitely something we're trying to to catch up on. And somewhat on a similar vein, I'm just talking about concessions. This question is um, maybe focused on tapping into our friends groups for assistance with funding for concessions or with gateway communities. Do we have examples of where that's taken place or where uh, the Park Service has been able to utilize dollars to help gateway communities and concessions retrofit? I do not have that answer. Um, uh, yeah, somebody else might have uh, experience and in, in success stories with that where, um, and we do get a lot of requests about that, how can you know? How can we help facilitate this small com community or this some some other entity outside the park itself um, 
you know, maybe change out their lighting or improve their lighting? What kind of funding sources are available? I, and I personally don't, I don't know what that might be at this time. And I don't, maybe Adam, if, if you've heard of any of those type of instances where communities or other groups have been successful in collaborating and, and obtaining funding. I was going to say, uh, I'm asked this question fairly often, um, and just as a point of reference, I mean, um, just on, from IDA side, we're an extremely small nonprofit with a limited budget, so we, we ourselves can offer funding, funding but um, in a lot of instances where communities have received funding, um, there's not necessarily one specific organization that can point people to. Um, what I would state is that a lot of the funding which has been um, achieved has been through um, foundations or through grants, um, which are kind of more at the regional or state um, or even local level. So there's no national or overarching level organizations I could point to, but um, there's been a, a few places um, which have essentially received grant funding um, from more like state um, or regional sources, um, but it seems to be um, not even necessarily consistent between that. So I wish that the answer were more concrete, but I think the best answer I have is just to not um, and to consider all sources of funding and to not necessarily rule out anything. Great. Um, and perhaps as a follow-up, we can um, try to put together some resources that we can get out to all the um, participants on funding opportunities. Um, there's a lot of comments in here that, Bob, I'll be sure to pass on to you. Um, just okay. Park speaking up, saying that they're interested in pursuing various designations, um, such as Fort Davis and Oregon Pipe Cactus, Wrangell St. Elias, um, and a few others. Um, one question here, are all the sky camera, CCD camera images required in order to receive approval, or are regular camera images sufficient to show light dome? So I'll answer that. Um, so we yeah, Adam, that just, jump in on that. Yeah, I'll, so I'll answer that. So we do not require um, all sky photometry. I mean, we we like to see it if possible, but it's definitely not required. So if you don't have access to um, that kind of specialized equipment, um, you're able to essentially utilize um, sky quality measurements through a sky quality meter um, combined with um, regular images of light domes um, that are panoramic um, of the park. And basically through the um, uh, images that uh, I see qualitatively as well as the data that's provided quantitatively of the sky overhead, I'm able to basically ascertain myself um, something comparable to what um, the all-sky photometry would provide. So uh, you definitely are not required to um, use all-sky photometry. Um, but if you have the data, then that's fantastic. Yeah, I'll just add on that. Um, we get that inquiry all the time from parks uh, across the system thinking we need we need you to come out with your camera system and measure because this we need this is what we need and as Adam said that's not a requirement what it really is doing with our system and we're very limited again there's um, about four working systems in in the MPS that we have you know two of our regional folks one in in the Pacific West region one in Dena uh, one in Alaska region and then two of us in our office are going out and at best in, in a good year, we're maybe hitting 10 parks, maybe maybe 12, 13 parks. Um, as you can see, that there's that's just the, we don't have the capacity, um, let alone the perfect night sky conditions every new moon and and all these things. So it's limiting. We're documenting the conditions in the park. We're establishing you know um, information that's really going to guide park management in the future for this resource, and and these images become uh, kind of a, a bonus if a park is pursuing you know any kind of dark sky designation but it, by no means is is it required there's other tools that we're developing that like Adam says that we're looking at really monitoring light domes on your horizon how those are increasing or decreasing and then also the the internal park lighting and and its um, impact on park resources so that, that's Great. Um, one last question here. I know, uh, acknowledging the time, we've had actually a couple more come in here, but um, I'm going to try to pull some of these together. Most of the questions that remain focus on resources that um, uh, we, parks might be able to use to work with um, in filling out an application. For instance, there's a question about is there a checklist or a booklet that a park could use to get started on an application. And there's another question about, you know, are there existing resources on working with gateway communities? Um, Bob, is there an internal site or something that we can point people to where they can 
um, have access to such resources? Kind of, it, it sounds like somebody's asking kind of a handbook on moving forward in this process. Is is that what I'm hearing in that question? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We we don't have that right now. There's a number of kind of guidance documents and and recommended best practices and other things that are in the works in our division, um, but really not a step by step at this point. And that might be you know a worthwhile um, product that helps people in, in this bigger effort, not just the IDA designation, but some of the other things they should be considering as, as they, you know, address the night sky resource from, you know, a lot of different perspectives. Um, yeah, that's a good question. We'll, um, we'll see if we can come up with, with a document that really is kind of a, um, a guideline for, for this. And I think I'll just jump on just uh, very briefly after and just mention that um, from IDA side, we actually um, publicly post all of the approved past designations. Um, so if you go onto IDA's website um, and go to our work, um, uh, Dark Sky Places program, you can click on um, any of the designation types, be it sanctuaries, parks, communities, um, and every single place which has been approved, including all previous NTS sites, um, you can actually have a live link to their application. That way you can see how they handled um, educational outreach, um, what their lighting um, uh, management plan entailed, um, what their inventory looks like, and to to essentially reference those already approved documents to use kind of not exactly as a template, but as a reference for um, how to move forward is also something that we can offer. Yeah, and I'll um, go ahead, uh, add on to that a little bit. Just one thing I, I say to a lot of parks, uh, they're coming in and I'll kind of think about, okay, what kind of park is this? Is this a historic park? Is this a, a large landscape wilderness park? And looking at that you know current list of 22 parks who've already gone through this process i'll try to connect them with you know one of these other parks uh, and and not have somebody reinvent the wheel when they're going through this process really see what somebody else did when they did this what were their hurdles what were their successes what what did they find very helpful um, and hopefully that kind of builds that network of support and the next time you know this next park comes along that um, they've got kind of a support group, really, in essence, that is a de facto, you know, document on how to go about this and and trying to match up, you know, similar situations. Great. Well, acknowledging um, that we're about 15 minutes past the hour, this has been an excellent presentation and some really great questions, um, just excellent dialogue. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and wrap up today's presentation. We'll have the recording of this presentation uploaded to both our internal Connected Conservation Toolkit as well as on that external site with the Network for Landscape Conservation. Um, Bob and Adam, thank you so much for, for being excellent presenters today and, and for uh, being flexible with the technology. Um, yeah. Sorry about the technology <laughs> loss. <laughs> no worries. Um, as for everyone else, we do have a second webinar later this month on March 20th. We'll be featuring a webinar on wildlife connectivity near Great Smoky Mountains National Park with the NTCA, so feel free to join us for that. You can register for that webinar and all of our others, again, on those two uh, websites that I've mentioned. Um, thanks again for joining us, and um, we'll, we'll be in touch soon. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. <laughs>